Hi, everyone who's joining us live on Zoom. Uh, we are so excited that you're joining us this afternoon. I'm uh, live here from Boston. My name is Stacey Furtado. I run our global social media team here at Monster. I also am one of the leaders of our employee resource group for LGBTQ plus professionals at Monster. Um, we're going to reference employee resources resource groups a little bit throughout this chat today. Um, that'll go until about 5 p.m. Um, you might hear them abbreviated as ERG at some point in time, and that's what we're referring to. My pronouns are she, her, and from now until about five, I'll be facilitating a conversation between all of you and this great panel of speakers. Wave, everybody. If you have any questions during this panel uh, for any of the participants at all, uh, we will be monitoring the Q&A section here and as well the comments on Facebook and on YouTube. So ask us a question wherever it is, and we'll try and get to it for the second half of the panel. Um, and if you're interested in more content from our Monster team, please follow us on social media at Monster on all of our social channels. If you see a typo, you can let me know about it because it's probably my fault. So uh, definitely monitor that stuff. Be my eyes and ears out there. And um, you can check out our awesome new homepage for recent graduates or people who are entering the workforce for the first time. It's at monster.com slash grads. So nice and easy to remember. And you can get resources on everything from job searching to interview prep to salary negotiation. So check that out anytime you're getting started and have a question. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about why we're here. Um, basically, it's Pride Month. And uh, while there's been so much progress made with our LGBTQ plus family, uh, having a seat at the table, there's a ton more work to be done. And all of you entering the workforce for the first time are gonna be the people doing the heavy lifting over the next few decades. And so many of you will be doing it across different parts of your identity, tackling things like racism, sexism, ableism, and other forms of marginalization at work well beyond your LGBTQ identity. And we're here to give you some of the tools you need to be to head into the office, uh, whether it be remote or in person, because we really don't know what that's going to look like soon. But um, and we want you to feel comfortable being yourself in that environment. And so when we were kind of figuring out what we were going to do this Pride Month here at Monster. We decided to put a poll out into the field to job seekers to kind of see where everyone was with um, their job search and as it related to finding an employer that values diversity and inclusion. So we asked candidates questions like, would you turn down a job offer at a place you didn't feel valued in inclusive and diverse workplace culture? 62% of candidates said, yeah, they would turn down that job offer. And then we asked, how likely are you to ask a company's diversity and inclusion efforts during an interview? So, you know, you would turn down the offer. How do you find out how actually focused on inclusivity they are? 51% of people said they wouldn't ask the question in an interview. So to me, it says pretty loud and clear that candidates are looking for companies that foster inclusive environments, but they don't yet have the tools to find them. And so our panelists here today are going to help you actually get those tools. So without further ado, I will uh, let Kay kick off introductions for us. Thank you, Stacy, and thanks for all your work organizing this event. My name is Kay Martinez. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. I am currently in Chelsea, Massachusetts. I am the Associate Director of the Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion for Mass General Hospitals uh, Institute of the Health Professions. I'm also a faculty member there. I teach a brand new course for uh, post-professionals in the occupational therapy program, and it's focusing on DEI and healthcare. Uh, before that, I just want to say my background has been in DEI or diversity, equity, inclusion work largely in higher education. My master's is in higher ed from Boston College. I've worked all over the country, Stanford, Harvard, Tufts, Birmingham State, uh, and I was also head of DNI and an LGBT nonprofit. So that's a little bit about me. And so I'll impressive. to uh, Brianna, thank you. Awesome, thank you, Kay. It's really hard to follow, follow you up on that one. Uh, it's really great to be here. Also kudos to Stacey for curating this awesome panel. It's exciting to meet all of you. Uh, my name is Brianna Bowles. I'm the Diversity and Inclusion Program Manager at Adobe. Uh, prior to Adobe, I was at an organization called Lesbian Sue Tech, and I should have said at the beginning my pronouns are she, her, hers. Uh, and Adobe is really my first corporate environment that I've ever worked in. Prior to Adobe, I was, as I mentioned, lesbian, as, at Lesbian Sue Tech. Um, I have a background in nonprofits, social work, as well as startups and creative agencies. So if you're curious about non-traditional candidates getting into tech or corporate environment, I'm here to tell you it's definitely possible. Um, I also have a master's in social work from, from Columbia where I blended uh, social impact work along with business. 
that gave me a great foundation and, and background in how to achieve um, impact in business through through social initiatives such as diversity and inclusion. Uh, I'm really excited to be here and speak with all of you. And with that, I'll pass it on to Jarvis. Thank you so much, Brianna. Appreciate it. And Stacy, thanks so much for bringing together such an incredible group of panelists. Uh, hello, everybody. Good afternoon from Portland, Oregon. Jarvis Sam here. I use he, him, his pronouns. And in my current capacity, I work as the Senior Director of Diversity Recruiting, Global Sourcing, and Talent Experience at Nike, essentially having accountability for around the first 70% of the recruitment lifecycle for how we engage talent, foster an acceleration of a diverse slate, as well as fostering inclusive and engaging experience for the team. I've been at Nike now for about two years, but prior to Nike, spent the last eight years working in the technology space. So most recently, I was the head of diversity and inclusion for Snapchat, and then at Google before that, doing diversity program management work and working in their diversity recruitment organization. I started my career, however, in strategy consulting, working closely with a lot of oil and gas and telecommunications companies to build out different approaches to mergers and acquisitions and divestitures. So I've seen both the HR side of this work from a variety of different capacities and worked on the business side. I received my degree from Rice University in history, public policy, and sport management, and remain deeply committed to the passion and purpose of advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion. Looking forward to chatting with you more. And I'm going to hand it off to Tom. All right. Thanks, Jarvis. Hi, everyone. My name is Tom Borden. I have been doing diversity and inclusion work for almost 20 years, uh, most recently as the head of inclusion and diversity at Staples. And I also am an instructor at Merrimack College, where I get to teach on diversity and social justice. It's such an honor to be here with this panel. And again, Stacy, thank you for pulling this together. And, and it's just so great to be able to still celebrate Pride Month um, and think about things like diversity and inclusion and equity with, with everything that's going on right now. I actually began doing the work also in higher education. Uh, yeah, almost 20 years ago at UCLA, I was thinking, gosh, you know, how can I make a change in the world? What's impacted my own life that drives me towards what I want to do? And I really struggled as an undergrad in terms of coming out. I didn't do so until right after. And I ended up getting a job at UCLA in their LGBT center, uh, working with someone named Dr. Ronnie Sam. A lot of people know her name because she's the one who created Lavender Graduation and so many things around LGBT career or LGBT centers and services. So. Um, the career path that I've been on has been really wonderful, and I'm really excited just to talk to you about diversity, inclusion, and how to support LGBTQ people in the workplace today. So we've been talking a bunch about diversity and inclusion, Tom. What does that actually mean? What do these departments do, and what roles can they take in different organizations? Right. So when we say d and in conversations like this, we're referring to diversity and inclusion, and I'd say that's the term that's most generally used in regards to the type of work that I and my fellow panelists do. But sometimes you'll see the words swapped around, like you might see inclusion and diversity, I and D, or you might see other associated words and terms such as equity, I got my shirt on here, uh, belonging, social justice, just as a few other examples um, of words that are associated with this work. And like I said, I actually began doing this type of work in higher education on college campuses, and I was lucky enough to work over a decade at three different colleges in LGBT centers. So in that type of environment, when it came to diversity and inclusion work, it really, for me at that stage, revolved around support, education, and advocacy, three real key elements to the work. Um, so in higher ed, in, you know, many people here today are in college or just coming out of college, that's where the work consisted of creating different mechanisms where people with shared identities and their allies can connect. That might be support groups or social groups, um, creating dedicated physical safe spaces where people could gather facilitating various events and trainings um, from the LGBT's perspective, um, adding that LGBT-minded focus to different committees on campuses, advocating for queer students, faculty, staff, alumni, lots of great work to do in higher ed. Um, eventually, in that setting, I got to begin to branch out even broader into other social justice type work and trainings on college campuses. So there, the work focused a lot more on those issues of equity and privilege, and marginalization based on all aspects of identity beyond just sexual orientation and gender identity. So when I think about what d &I is, I think to the career that I've held where I began to eventually look outside of higher ed and do work in government settings, nonprofit, corporate settings, and the work definitely expands into all industries. So if you're at a stage right now where you're looking at getting a job, it's so important to keep in mind that all industries and companies can be committed to d and 
It's not just in higher ed or just in corporate. Um, and I found that outside of higher education, there's a lot of similarities to the type of work that goes on around DNI. and um, but there's also sometimes some differences. So for sure, outside of higher education, still there's a key focus on creating welcoming environments where people can ideally bring their entire selves to work, feel comfortable and be set up to thrive. Oftentimes you do see it through, you know, ERGs, the employee resource groups, as Stacy mentioned, or other mechanisms. But there's also some differences when you get to say d and in the corporate world. So for instance, now I get to spend a lot of my time helping companies and the leaders and people look at data, such as how diverse are the job applicants or the people that we're hiring or the customers that we're serving, how diverse is leadership and who's being promoted internally. And also what kind of differences are going on within a company when you're looking at employees based on different aspects of identity. So that could be based on race or gender or even sexual orientation, if you can capture that information. When it comes to employees' experiences at the company, how they're performing within the organization, all different aspects of an employee's experience. So this is why you now see more and more companies either having a person or a department that is gonna be dedicated to DNI, because companies realize that the more diverse and inclusive the workplace, the better they're gonna be able to attract top talent, serve a really diverse marketplace that's out there, and ultimately come out on top in a really competitive work environment. So I'll just wrap up by saying, I cannot encourage you enough if you're looking for a job right now to hopefully find a place where you can be your true, beautiful, diverse self in a work environment that does celebrate DNI and celebrates the LGBTQ plus community, and one that doesn't just tolerate or accept you for the differences that you bring to work, but instead actually says, we want you, we need you, because you're gonna add incredible diversity to our team and so much value to our organization. Thanks, Tom. I think that was a yeah. pretty great overview of, of what diversity and inclusion actually is in the workplace. Um, all right, so let's say that I'm a candidate and I've found a few companies that I'm really excited about applying to. Um, I know that they have put a lot towards their diversity and inclusion efforts publicly, and I really want to join the team. Jarvis, with your background of recruiting and diversity and inclusion, can you tell us a little bit more about how to stand out as a candidate? What are your companies looking for? What programs do you have in place? Um, just tell us a little bit more about the whole process. Absolutely. So in my experience as, as a recruiter, I often tell people I have reviewed nearly 25,000 resumes from candidates at various conferences and events to resume portals through online applications to employee referrals coming in for talent. And in that experience, there's a few things that often stand out that really highlight candidates that end up doing really well throughout the life cycle. It really is a focus on how well do you understand the scope, background, and interest of the company. When you think about your resume, a lot of times people think about it as a simply a static document that you hand out from company to company to company with the hopes of securing a role. Rather, your resume is a dynamic document that should be framed in such a way that helps capture your interest in a particular company and more specifically, in a specific role. This is your one opportunity to, through one to two pages, fully express your background and experience, giving us a biography of sorts of your life, but also your passions. What talent often leads off of resumes though, is while it's important to capture those core skills that make you qualified and applicable for the role, companies are really interested in knowing the well-rounded nature of an individual. So obviously for a company like Nike, the idea of having a passion for sport is something that's so critical that we tend to look for in people's resumes. Now this doesn't mean necessarily having historically played, because trust me, my, my one year of playing fifth grade basketball, simply for the participation trophy because I needed something gold in my room, does not stand out as what they were looking for. Additionally, it's not simply a focus on do you watch sports? Rather, it's understanding, do you understand the connectivity that exists between the role athletes, to which we often define athletes with an asterisk, meaning one who has a body, and the connection that that has to the way that we show up in the broader marketplace. So then it becomes a question of congruence. How do you ensure that your resume speaks to the congruence of the skills experiences or values of that company to what it is that you actually seek out of the opportunity. Time and again, particularly for early and career professionals, I will often see real estate used on your resume around an objective statement. And oftentimes it typically reads something a little like, to secure a role as a software engineer at Nike. And I'm like, well, you applied for that job, so I kind of gathered that piece already. 
Rather, you want to take that opportunity to use a couple of sentences or perhaps even a paragraph to reflect to the recruiter the likelihood of your interest, how your background and experience is actually aligned to the values or maxims of the company, and what receiving that role would actually mean in terms of your value add or value creation that you would provide to the company. So make it more of a persuasive statement as opposed to something that's simply informative around what your desire is. Once you're then able to capture that and then outline your experience from there, at least to a greater likelihood of additional consideration. Put simply, recruiters are going to spend less than 20 seconds looking at that resume. And on average, once you're really well equipped and skilled at the art and craft of effective recruiting, we're probably spending less than seven to 10 seconds evaluating your resume, just in terms of that first pass through. So understanding some of the skills and tricks that allows you to get that second look are so critical. Having some identifiable elements on there is of utmost importance so that the company can see what point of view you want to highlight. Now, I'll go ahead and talk a little bit about cover letters, actually, as I just saw that comment come through uh, from one of the participants. Cover letters vary by company, I will tell you. Some companies, you submit it, and people don't actually read it. Others, it's vitally important. It creates a narrative of your experience and how I should be thinking about you in terms of consideration for the role. When you think about your resume, you're really looking at what are those points of value creation that makes you stand out amongst a sea of talent that's coming in. That as you are crafting your narrative of yourself, understand the, the significance of being true to yourself and understanding that what you seek to bring to the table, it is just as important that the company aligns to those same standards. So don't feel like you have to force yourself to retrofit your background resume or cover letter to fit a company or even when you're in interviewing processes. Rather, it should be holistic and deeply connected. Thanks, Jarvis. Um, and we had just one follow-up about it. So what would, you, what would you suggest people actually name that section? So if it's not something like objective or summary, would it be snapshot or about me or something along those lines? Yeah, I think you can get creative. I think that this is your opportunity to understand what's the lingo that's utilized around the company. I often love seeing resumes where talent has clearly uh, research Nike. They know what our five maxims are, and they're using the various elements of their resume to help reflect that. So for example, if someone were to have that objective or career summary statement, say, be on the offense always, it shows me they understand Nike's culture, cultural history, cultural traditions, and what our maxims are. So I think that there's an opportunity to be relatively generic in what you put there. However, if you want to show that edge and that you're deeply engaged with the company, use some of the rhetoric or lingo that they utilize to, to incite a focus on that summary. Thanks, Jarvis. That was great. I think that people can take a lot of actionable stuff from that. We have the job. We are interviewing for the job that we want. And we get into the interview room. Kate, can you speak a little bit to how to actually get signs in the interview that companies are doing more than just putting up, you know, colorful advertisements saying that they promote diversity and inclusion and just having a statement on their site. Like how can you actually tell that a company is really adopting uh, inclusiveness in their culture in an interview? And then kind of on the flip side of that, what are some red flags? I'm just going to add a little bit of the before the interview too. So for yeah, sure. and especially for trans and binary folks on the line, also for allies at companies who may be on the line as well, I can tell a lot about an organization and where they're at by their forms and what language they're using on the forms. So for me as a trans person, um, you know, giving my legal name right off the bat, giving legal sex markers uh, is not necessary. That's really something that is necessary when I am hired. That's when you need my I-9, W-4, all that stuff. So you really don't need that in the candidate stage. And I know that there are companies that work with companies, especially tech clients in the Bay Area as a consultant, who have totally revamped um, their process so that they are more trans inclusive. Also for undocumented folks, folks who don't have social security numbers, you don't need that in the candidate stage. That should be afterwards when you're hired. Um, so I just wanna put that out there. So there's a lot of work that I do upfront uh, to understand or, or get a sense of where companies are at. So I'm looking at mission statements on websites to Jarvis's point, what language are you using on your website? Also tells me a lot about where you are. Uh, do you have a DNI office? Do you have a head of DNI? Uh, if I can pull up your about us, your team page, I look at everybody's photos. How many people there look like me? Are there people who do not look like me? Uh, gives me a sense of the visual uh, diversity, racial uh, diversity, and, and recognizing, of course, that there are aspects of diversity that are not visible. 
But I just want to say that, right? When I scroll down and I see, you know, 10 out of 10 people are white men or white passing men, that sends a message to me. And that's what I'm looking for. Um, but to your question, <laughs> the, uh, the interview, right? So I think great things in an interview, um, folks who introduce themselves with pronouns are really big uh, as a consultant, especially uh, in the West Coast tech space, you know, right at the like visitor sign in, they print out name badges and you can add your name and pronouns. So that's a big marker to me as a candidate, just right when you enter. Also accessibility, right? The shape of a building, are there gender neutral bathrooms, right? Are there ramps? Can folks get in there? So I'm just kind of like peeping everything uh, that, a, that a space is telling you about how, how they value diversity. Uh, in the interview itself, uh, <laughs> I definitely experienced it as a candidate, um, microaggressions, folks say things. Uh, so I note that, right? It's a professional setting. Um, you know, I, I still want to engage and see if I want this job, but like I'm flagging that in my head, like, oh, okay, this person just made a comment. Um, I might have to work with this person. Is that something that, you know, I really want to think about? Um, you know, how, how is that going to impact my day to day? So that has absolutely happened. And then I think some key questions for you to ask as a candidate, um, we've mentioned ERGs before, right? And play resource groups. Uh, just a Fast fact, history fact, um, ERGs were first started by Xerox. Um, the year 1968, 1969, after Martin Luther King's assassination, was huge for diversity and inclusion work. Uh, in higher education, that's when we first saw um, mass demonstrations led by black students demanding that they want black studies, ethnic studies, um, offices that were dedicated to multicultural affairs, which are like the grandfather <laughs> of DNI. Um, these words have shifted over time, multicultural affairs, DNI, inclusive excellence, whatever it is today, belonging. Um, and so recognizing that it all came from that era where people demanded change. And I think we're living through that moment right now. Organizations are scrambling uh, to show what are we doing because employees are putting that pressure on organizations because of the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, protests that we're seeing across the country saying, what are we doing right now? And I think it's really key that that is coming from employees and ERGs, and I just want to say where that came from. So asking that, you know, what kind of ERGs do you have will let you know. And I also want to say that there's no perfect organization out there. Racism, all the isms, the things you mentioned exist everywhere. But I think for us, we want to ascertain this culture and this climate. Is it something that can change? Do they care about change? You know, am I going to do all that work by myself? Am I going to have strong allies uh, in the space? Does leadership care about this top down? So I just want to mention that because no one ever told me that. <laughs> and I thought that this like mythical, magical company existed that I could just hop around and find like the perfect place, but it's not. Uh, there's a comment here, what are ERGs, employee resource groups, so like affinity groups at work. So black organizations, LGBT organizations, Latinx ones, groups for women, groups for you name it. Um, different companies are, are trying, veterans, they're trying to find these spaces, build these spaces for the employees. Uh, to build community and also work with the organization to meet their needs. So, yeah, um, always happy to chat more, you know, for folks um, online, Twitter, whatever, especially for trans, uh, non-binary young folks, um, young folks of color at these intersections. There's not a lot of us out there visible. Um, so, yeah, I, I hope to connect with y'all. Thanks, Kay. Uh, that was great. Some great information. And, you know, at the end of the day, all of us want to feel good about the work we're doing and we want to walk into the office or be remote and we want to feel like we're being supported in the office. And so the interview is a really great way to actually start to interview the company as well. And that's something that, you know, Kay spoke to really well. So thank you so much. Um, okay. So we got through the interview. We're hired at the company. We have our first job. What a world We're we're getting out there. Brianna, Adobe has some awesome programs in place to help with things like mentorship. And, uh, but when I'm walking through that door day one, and I know you experienced this a couple of years ago, getting into corporate world for the first time. Um, where do, how do I find a mentor? How do I find someone who can kind of show me the ropes? And how much can my personal experiences uh, differentiate me as a leader? Yeah, thank you for asking, Stacey. And I'm actually going to go back to something that Jarvis said that I think is just as relevant in the interview and resume creation stage as it is when you're at the company. And it all comes down to your narrative and your story and your strengths. You know, your strengths are something that are unique to you. Everyone has their own unique combination of what that looks like. And so I think really doing the work and the time to think about what those are, think about what matters to you and where you wanna go in your career 
are key. You know, before embarking on a journey to find a mentor, you know, it really comes to, to be able to make the most out of that mentor relationship. It really comes down to the skills and the direction that you want to go in your career. So I think, you know, in that process, as you're thinking about your career arc and first, you know, putting your resume together and getting into a company, as you're thinking about that narrative, um, also know that it'll evolve, it'll change, and and it'll grow along with you. And so I think before you engage in, in uh, identifying a mentor, it's all about reflecting on kind of what are your strengths, um, where are some areas that you want your career to go, and, you know, whether it's in your mind or whether you articulate it, you know, at Adobe, we have something called tap your network. And that's all about articulating your career path, your direction, and being able to, alongside that, aligned to the, the directions that you want to go, identifying people at the company who are aligned to that direction. So, you know, you might be, for example, in marketing, or you might be in IT, and maybe you want to pursue, pursue a career in diversity and inclusion. Maybe you want to pursue a career at a different part of the business. But the first step is articulating that and articulating kind of where you want to go and what your strengths are. And from there, I actually want to answer a question in the chat about, you know, what are ERGs, which are employee resource groups, um, or at Adobe, we call them employee networks. And I think as we think about uh, going to that question of how to find a mentor, I think your ERGs are employee networks. And also as you're in the interview process asking, you know, if a company has communities for underrepresented groups or has uh, an LGBTQ plus or pride ERG, um, that, that's also a great indicator of inclusion. And that's a great source of mentors. Um, you know, you can also look once you get in a company at sometimes they have it on an intranet or a hub. So you can see um, all of the different employees at a company and doing some searches there to really, you know, think about and, and in those searches, going back to your, if you kind of map out your strengths, your goals, where you want to go in your career, thinking about people at the company who closely align to that, to where you want to go, um, whether it's where you want to go or they have a skill that you want to develop. You know, I think to make the most out of that mentor relationship, it really does come down to aligning that mentor to where you want to go. Um, and so I think another sign of inclusion at a company is an openness and a receptiveness from, from leaders to inbounds and emails and questions um, and initiation of a mentoring relationship. So, you know, I guess if we had to go back to the question, Stacey, I think first it's all about before engaging with a mentor, really reflecting on your narrative, your strengths um, and your career journey, where you, where you are and where you want to go. And then second is aligning to people at the company who, who most match, you know, what that looks like, both through your ERGs, the ERGs of, of that company, um, or, you know, across the company by searching um, what's available to you when you look, when you're at the company and you see, you know, how to search through databases to find employees. But I would say a big sign of inclusion um, and something you can ask about in that, in that interview process is what mentorship looks like at the company, as well as what their ERG or employee network um, programs also look like. And that closely aligns to my role. If you have any other questions about that, happy to answer. Um, my side of the house within diversity and inclusion or DEI is less recruiting and more partnership with our employees. Um, and I actually want to speak to another question I saw in the chat. Yeah, so aligned to my role in partnering with employees on the change uh, within the company around DEI is this question, what are some challenges to making DEI a part of everyone's job description rather than a separate department? And first of all, I can't even tell you how much I love that question because that tells me you understand the nuances <laughs> within D DEI so much. You know, it, it truly is everybody's role at the company. And I think the biggest challenge is communicating that to your senior leaders and your CEO um, because, you know, for most folks, it will kind of take that uh, the C highest levels of leadership to communicate it for folks to understand that it's a business priority. Mm -hmm. And so I feel really fortunate to be at a company where, and, and you know, I think the cultural context we're in right now is a really unique one where I think if the CEO isn't making a statement or communicating with employees, I think they're seeing that they need to, or they might need to kind of maybe shift their mindset. Um, but I think that that can be the biggest challenge is really helping as a core DEI team kind of get your CEO, your VPs, kind of that really top leadership bench 
um, kind of understanding why DEI is a priority and then partnering with them on how to really send communications or integrate DEI into their practices so that it really trickles down. And so it really does become everybody's, everybody's part of everybody's job. And I also feel fortunate that our employee, we have a lot of very passionate employees who care. They want to make a difference. Um, so I would say for those super, what I call like our super users who are super passionate about DEI, it's also managing their engagement so that, you know, they are partnering alongside us, that the initiatives they're driving are also aligned to our goals as well. So I would say those two, two uh, challenges come to mind. Brianna, I love that you brought that question up because I actually pinged Stacy also. And I was like, oh, can we talk about that question? Because it's such an important one. Um, and I'll just add a little more also. I, I mean, yes, I also love that question. Sometimes you'll see things in job descriptions or employee or company values where it'll indicate what your role is. But I would say I haven't seen it often actually implemented into the job description itself, which is fine. That doesn't mean that you're not still necessarily expected or, or they're hoping that you can still contribute. And there might be some specific mechanisms to getting involved. Maybe it is through an employee resource group or joining a committee. Or if you're in a company that has a lot of different sites, maybe you could start your own little um, DNI committee at that site or whatever it might be. Um, but also, you know, when companies are doing things like implementing trainings or having different opportunities for you to learn more or to advocate, get involved. Your voice is important. You understanding these issues and how to support people with different identities is critical. And also be the squeaky wheel. I know, you know, leading DNI at a big company, when people email me or reach out to me, I listen. I want to know what they have to say. And most often I say, this is great. Let's figure out how together we can work at whatever this issue might be. So there's so much work to be done. Like everyone can take a role in it. Thanks, Tom. That was a great add on to that too. And Brianna, thank you for all of that awesome information. Um, we have a ton of questions coming in. And so that's going to be the remainder of our time is just answering your questions. So I'm going to kick off with some that I've seen come through. Um, okay, so we have a couple different ones here that I think are related to each other. Um, one of them is that when it comes to topics that may be deemed controversial by colleagues, things like racism, ableism, sexism, how do you calculate risk in meetings to make those statements but not lose credibility in the room? So, you know, you're sitting in a meeting, you, you see something or hear something that maybe isn't quite right, doesn't sit with you, and you want to say something, but you want to make sure that your your voice is one that's that's heard and that it's actually um you know not losing you credibility with your boss who you may just be learning new things about as the meetings and days are going on um does anyone have any advice on what people can kind of do to to make sure that they're they're you know pushing for some changes at the company but in a way that's actually helping their career advance as well i just want to jump in on that i think identity is really important because when I say something and a white person says something, we say the exact same thing, uh, things can be taken differently. And that's real. And, you know, we all can't be squeaky wheels because there are different consequences for us. So we know that there are stereotypes um, that exist out there, women in particular, women of color, uh, men of color. If you say something, you're perceived as aggressive. Uh, you are perceived as uh, not a team player. Whereas bias exists, gender-based bias conflated with race, that when a white man says it, they're seen as you know, de demonstrating great leadership qualities. So I just want to say that the game is not fair for us, and we all have to recognize that and think about our identities and relationship to power and privilege. So for the queer and trans people of color on the line, um, I want to say that for us, a lot of our strength comes in numbers, safety comes in numbers. Uh, if you are in a situation where there's a union, um, some organizations do have union protections, you are therefore more protected to try to advance changes more safely. Um, I think we know now, given the Time's Up move movement um, and the Me Too movement, that there have been many instances, unfortunately, largely women, but not exclusively, uh, who have tried to, you know, raise awareness for instances of gender-based discrimination and harassment, and they did not get the recourse uh, that they deserved within their institutional channels. And so I just want to say that, you know, it's irresponsible for us to say that everyone needs to speak out and call things out because there can be an adverse impact on you. But I think what I've seen personally and can speak to effective ways uh, of creating change, especially for those of us who have the most marginalized or targeted identities, is by building coalitions 
um, with your peers, um, seeking and identifying allies that you can trust to work together, presenting proposals. Um, and it may not be safe, you know, your boss may say something in a meeting, you know, although you know it to be wrong, it may not be safe for you to say it to them right in the meeting, but maybe in a back channel, you know, if you have a private one-on-one -on -one session, or if there's a trusted ally in the room, you know, you can meet with them after and, and they can step in for you. So I just want to say that there's a lot of variables. Um, and also, you know, depending on the state that you're in, we have different legal protections, especially for trans people. Um, we are facing a major court case in the Supreme Court talking about uh, trans-based uh, harassment in the workplace. Um, I believe the person who is the plaintiff had just passed away in May, Amy uh, Stevenson, I think. I'll, I'll put her name in the chat. And so we are pending legislation right now on a federal level about the safety of raising uh, you know, concerns regarding gender-based harassment for trans people. So I just want to say that, you know, we wouldn't be here without the advocacy of people who came before us, um, but there are real dangers. Hey, as a follow-up to that, um, how can other people who, you know, might be coming from a place of privilege actually become allies in those meetings? So, you know, understanding all of that, uh, how for the people who are sitting in the room, you know, how can they, how can they help? So one very specific example with me, you know, my pronouns are they, them, theirs. I'm often the first person in an organization that has had, um, that, that uses these pronouns, particularly at my level. And so it's a different game. And I've been very fortunate to work with great people who are allies. And so if I get misgendered in a space, the, the folks that I know and love in the space will say, oh, you know, K and, and they, and they'll just amplify it right in that moment. And so there are subtle allyship, um, things that you can do. And I know that my allies have also reached out to people who have, you know, mis uh, misgendered me inadvertently in a meeting. And they'll pull me aside and be like, hey, you know, I talked to that person, like I'm on it. And so in the workplace, like for those of us who are advancing social change, like we have to recognize that um, although things are wrong, we can't just call them out because we might not have a job tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, but for the allies in the room, especially white folks, cisgendered men, um, y'all have that power and, and use it. And we're working together to advance change. I have written extensively about misgendering the workplace, I published in Business Insider and Huffington Post, um, to name a few. And so I can put those resources in the chat for folks who want to be allies uh, on how you can address that. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we're getting a couple questions here from people who are either on the call from career services or from small businesses or um, some companies. And they're great questions. Things like, um, what are some actionable steps your companies can take to, diverse recruit, to recruit diverse candidates? Um, just different things like that. If our panelists wouldn't mind actually answering those in the chat, I want to try and keep the stuff focused to um, the actual students who are on the call for now, but please keep those questions coming too, and we'll make sure that we're, we're getting to answers and helping out in the different ways that we can, um, for sure. And so we have um, a question that came in, and Jarvis, I think you can probably speak to this one the best, um, about uh, GPAs. And Basically, the exact question is um, how to work with AI filters, which we all know, um, you know, resumes end up getting scanned oftentimes uh, for keywords and things along those lines. And if you really want to stand out, if you don't necessarily have what's been deemed maybe as, um, you know, a perfect resume with a high GPA or things along those lines. And for um, the attendee who asked that question, I didn't have a very high GPA, so I'm with you on that. That was definitely one of my concerns coming out of school. Sorry to the University of Delaware people on the line, still got a great education. Um, but basically, how can, how can you show your diverse background on a resume um, to actually help you stand out, even if there's not kind of those, those things on there that, um, that necessarily are, are deemed like uh, attractive as a candidate? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, to address the previous comment too, Stacey, anyone interested in uh, more context around diversity recruitment or career services, feel free to just add me on LinkedIn and we can have a whole conversation around next steps, best approaches, etc. For the conversation around minimum qualifications. So the way several companies use AI technology, the short story is it's quite problematic. And I think the way that artificial intelligence is showing up, particularly with the impact that it has on diverse communities, is continually causing numerous companies to understand, is it adding more value or is it having a net negative impact on how they're actually screening resumes or evaluating talent? Now, the maintaining of a minimum standard or minimum requirement for a particular role is critical. However, for the majority of jobs, the only reason that a company will use a GPA minimum is as an indicator of a person's ability to, quote, work hard in a role 
or get the job done. However, as numerous works that have been published by Harvard Business Review, by Northwestern University, and a variety of others reveal, indication of performance in things like GPA or standardized testing doesn't actually provide an accurate indicator on an individual's ability to perform well at a job because it doesn't take into account the numerous externalities that a person might be facing or might be impacted with connected to them going through school or academic environments. Particularly if you take communities of color as well as the LGBTQ plus community, we often find ourselves having to work numerous jobs while also involved in higher education whether at the community college level, four year degree programming or even graduate programming. And as a result, this does impact things like GPA or our performance throughout our tenure in those spaces. And so you can typically do a lot of research ahead of time to understand what companies are using a, a resume scanner or AI technology to attempt to just go through and evaluate a resume. And one of the quick and easy ways to get around it, quite frankly, is don't feature the GPA on there at all. Um, and the system can't read it. And quite frankly, the way that they typically work is there is a back end that holds a certain amount of keywords that companies are looking for. Those words are typically also found in the job description. So where you have relevant experience that accurately reflects what's featured on those job descriptions, tailor your resume such that it captures that same info. This allows you to get past that point of first refusal, if you will, done by the artificial intelligence and move on to the next phase in the interview process. It's just a, a trick that I have taught and used with talent before because you all deserve an accurate review from an individual on this work. Because at the very least, companies that are more forward thinking are more progressive are providing unconscious bias awareness trainings to their recruiting team. And so I would trust a recruiter who has at least some semblance of UBA training over an AI system that was likely developed by somebody who has a level of inherent or intrinsic bias that was literally built or coded into the frame. And if you don't believe that this AI system is not working in this same regard, simply Google images of professional men's haircuts versus unprofessional men's haircuts. I think you'll find that the first two images under unprofessional have a cultural relevance to the black community that's quite unique. Thanks, Jarvis. And we had actually one question that I just want to piggyback on that because it makes sense. Um, is it better to contact decision makers in addition to applying online on job sites? So, you know, a lot of times you can see who's posting things on LinkedIn or you can figure out just by doing the proper amount of research who's actually going to be interviewing you. Um, do people want to be contacted? What is the, and just a, a quick plug, if anyone is into social media, please connect with me after this. Um, you know, we may be looking for a marketer in the future. We don't have a position open right now, but I'm always looking to connect um, with incredible social media and marketing uh, people, especially um, younger people who are looking to break in. So please um, reach out on LinkedIn after this. Um, right. Yeah. So to respond to your question, Stacey, the, the answer is absolutely. So if you think about what a recruiter's job is, it can arguably be very transactional. Good recruiters are more relational, but the transactional nature means job opens, job posts. Their end goal or desire is to land a talent in a role. And so who wouldn't be looking for the easiest point of entry to do that? And so I often encourage talent that applying on a job or going through the active portal, so jobs.insertcompaniesname.com or careers.com slash company will only get you so far. Having a strong and developed network of recruiters and decision makers that actually have a role in the job is going to be much more impactful. I will tell you, I get contacted probably by about 100 people a day on LinkedIn. And in the majority of cases where people send me their resume and I think they're a good fit for a job, either at Nike, at a previous institution where I've worked, or with my network of recruiting colleagues and counterparts where I know they might be searching for a role, I'm handing those resumes off. We don't have that same availability or amenity when it comes to the active portal because we're doing a very much one-to-one -one ratio of is this person an adequate fit for this particular role? More progressive companies will be looking at that talent pool in the form of an open marketplace where they'll say, well, maybe not a good fit for this role, but how could I reposition this talent? But that's not the lived experience of most companies. And so just understand you are better off reaching out to key stakeholders in companies to seek these opportunities. At the end of the day, there will be some people who will be gun ho about it, who will be more proactive and super excited to contact you and help position you throughout the process. For those that don't reply, you haven't really lost anything. Rather, you've now expanded your network that much more. So I think it's an incredibly smart strategic play to reach out to individuals from companies. Thanks, Jarvis. That's great. Good, good, clear advice there for sure. Um, 
Okay, so we had a, another great question come in. Um, so if you ever feel undervalued, should I start making records of dates and incidents in which I feel treated unfairly or should I share right away? Should I wait until I have various instances? Um, just looking for some guidance once you're kind of at work and not feeling uh, comfortable. So um, does anyone have any, any to weigh in there? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to because I work with a team at Adobe. So different companies call them different things. We have something called our Employee Resource Center, which is if an employee has an escalation of any sort, they can, of course, report it. And we really position our ERC as a partner, as somebody who really maintains confidentiality and privacy. Um, we also, and another part of that team is called Employee Relations as well. And so the ERC ultimately reroutes. I'm sure every company has this, but a lot of times what they'll do is they'll collaborate with me if it relates to, as part of the diversity and inclusion team, if it relates to anything within diversity or inclusion, whether it's how a manager or a team dynamic going on, whether it's, um, you know, something going on with somebody being trans and feeling like certain policies or procedures or communications haven't been inclusive. And we intervene pretty immediately as well as help it inform our progress and how we move forward. Um, we're having a transgender awareness session that really came out of a need. You know, I really look at the data closely um, based on what's reported. So we really encourage our employees, hey, if you are experiencing something, if you are observing something with somebody else that you that maybe they think is fine, but you think, hey, maybe that's not right, we really do encourage folks to submit a case. Um, because that really allows us to look at the data and then make really informed and, and smart, inclusive decisions based on that, um, including our transgender awareness session that we're really excited to roll out with employees. So I would say um, it all comes down to an openness. And I know not everyone has that level of trust and an openness to feel comfortable doing so at their company, but to the extent that you do feel comfortable and open, um, that's one place to go. And then as a diversity and inclusion team, the second place, you know, our, our top priority is building trust with our employees, um, maintaining confidentiality, listening. Um, my colleague, Karita, and I, you know, really make ourselves available to our employees on our internal communication tools like Slack. Um, I don't know if folks have heard of that. Um, you know, to, to really just be there, to really um, be a support, really listen. Um, at, so I would say to the extent that you feel open um, and comfortable, I'm uh, really sharing that because I, I, and I'm not trying to tout, like, tout our own horn here, I'm, I'm sure, and I, at all the companies represented on this call and a lot out there, you know, they genuinely care about their employees and want to help. It's just about having visibility into where the needs are. Um, so the more, you know, you can speak up and, and kind of um, report in a way that's comfortable to you, I think um, folks are, are eager to, you know, take action based on that. Thanks, Brianna. That's great. And if anyone else wants to jump in, just if you can also just include a little bit about some people might be applying to small businesses also, right? And so um, how, what does that look like for them in those roles as well, um, outside of even just the corporate also? I would just add, you know, like a personal note. Oh, man, we have to work for now. I'm not trying to work forever. So I just want to say that. <laughs> yeah. I would like to retire in like five years, maybe. That is the plan. I'm just... <laughs> things I have to do and so, yeah. <laughs> and so I just I want to keep it real with folks you know like we're in a capitalist society you know I'm not personally wealthy I'm not I'm not, not from a rich family I know some of us on the line actually they have a lot of people depending on you you may have to give money to others um and so I want to recognize that you know some of us like do not have this level of privilege where we can be like if I don't feel 100% great here like I'm leaving like no I actually got bills to pay um, and so I just want to name that. And as to the question, you know, should I ever start making records? Yes, absolutely. And I would keep them private, right? It's like a journal, a Google Doc. You know, today I felt like you know my ideas got got co-opted, or you know someone else got credit for them. And I'm like, keep it. And then like take a breath, like step back, and like think about like how am I going to like strategically address this? Is it something that can come up in my one-on-one -on -one, in my performance review? You know, is it something that I need to escalate up the chain to HR? Am I seeing a pattern here? Like, am I continuously not being valued? Like, what are my personal goals? If this organization is not meeting my goals, what can I get from this situation and leverage it to the next step? Um, and I want to just also mention that, you know, there are other channels too. Like, you can seek outside legal counsel to advise you on how to proceed in a situation that you feel um, is truly unfair and unjust because it very well may be. 
And so I want y'all to have all these tools at your disposal because I know sometimes like, you know, these things happen and I don't know how to handle it. And I just need a day, I need a breath and I will come back to it. And sometimes it really is just that um, intolerable that it needs to be rectified right away. And so there's no one size fits all approach here, but just trust your gut and your instincts and that the universe has you, you are talented um, and you will make it work. I think one quick tactical item that I'll add there is the importance of document, document, document. And this applies whether at a small business or a large company. If you are in a position where you feel uncomfortable by something that is said or something that is done, I think a one-on-one -on -one conversation is a really great place to start with an individual, particularly under the construct of assuming positive intent. Let's be real. There's some moments where you know it wasn't. But at the end of the day, make sure that as a follow-up to those moments, document, 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 because if there ever comes a time where you need to prove that something happened, having that written documentation, and I'm talking about a two-way communication. So if you have connected with somebody in a one-on-one -on -one verbal forum, then send them a note reiterating some of the key points that came out of that discussion. That way it is at least documented. The role of human resources in that regard is to be a center of expertise and business partner for you in that forum to work as an advocate for understanding the scope and nature of incidences of escalations and to help you as an employee feel both psychologically and physically safe in that moment. There do come opportunities though, where while certain functions of HR have to maintain a level of confidentiality up to a point, there are certain municipal, state, and even federal regulations that if there is threat or harm involved, where they may need to escalate and, and bring the person in and potentially inform them of the conversation or circumstance. The more that you have that information documented is a personal protection for you. And I know as an early career professional myself back when, I struggled with that idea of, well, is this gonna seem shady? Is it gonna seem shifty to do? It is the biggest protection that you can offer yourself to make sure your thoughts are captured effectively. Mm, thanks. Um, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Kay. Okay. Um, so when, when we say document, what do we mean? Day, time, location, who is there, what happened? Um, I don't know about you, but like, you know, if it's a triggering situation, I might not remember it a week later. So for you to like take some notes somewhere, you know, on your phone, something, so you can have that later. And like, those are the, the things that you want to record. Um, you can then, you know, as we said, reflect on it later, escalate it up to HR or your own outside legal counsel. But those are the specifics that you're going to want to keep. Um, so, for example, right, for us in the LGBT community, are people making homophobic jokes at work? You know, did someone say something about my attire, my appearance? Um, you know, Jarvis mentioned, like, haircuts, or these cultural jokes, right? But they're actually microaggressions or macroaggressions. And so you want to make sure that you have that um, recorded, and then you can decide the best course of action. Thanks, Kay. That's great. Thanks for that. That's a good follow-up. Okay, so we have five minutes left. I see a bunch of unanswered questions. Please, we're going to try and get to some of these um, in follow-up, but if you really want um, to connect with one of the panelists specifically, I'm stacy.furtado at monster.com. Let me know um, what you have to ask them, and I will connect you with them afterwards so um, we can make sure that you guys kind of can, can continue the conversation for sure so that you don't lose access to these great minds. Um, but before we go, all right, guys, I didn't even tell you we're doing this. Lightning round. What is, we're going to start with you, Brianna, all right? So get ready. All right. What it. is um, the one thing you wish that you knew coming out of school um, and entering the workforce for the first time? I wish I had known that nobody is going to give me opportunities. Um, that's not, that's just not going to happen. That, and that also means mentorship, leadership, and feedback. Um, yeah, mentorship, leadership, and feedback, you know, it's really on me to seek it out and carve time out for it. I have kind of, I guess it's a good trait, but also the bad trait of kind of being a workhorse. I tend to put my nose down and just get my work done and just really kind of go, go, go. But I think the downside of that is I'm not able to really look up and think about my own career goals, what I really want, um, and then what I can do to help get me there. And so I wish someone had told me, hey, you need to pay attention to you. You need to pay attention to your future. And you need to put as much work as you're putting into the job you're getting paid to do to where you personally want to go. Um, and so every once in a while, I try to remind myself of that. Or I'll, um, I have some friends, we call each other accountability buddies or partners to just kind of remind each other that 
were the most important thing. Um, work is always going to be there, <laughs> um, but it really does come down to to where you want to go. So ooh, I hope I answered that question. I wasn't oh, I think that's that. great. And I, <laughs> I definitely agree with that for sure that, you know, I understand that I am 13 years into my career and I still have the conversation all the time with my friends and family of not knowing what I want to be when I grow up. Mm-hmm. And that is never going to change. And that is a good thing because that means that you are always growing and learning. And so um, definitely reiterate that. And thank you for saying that. All right. Who's next? I got it. I feel the spirit. <laughs> all right. Um, just that your value is not determined by your job. And what I mean by that for me very specifically, um, you know, I'm the first person in my family to get a master's degree, parents are immigrants. And so I felt this tremendous pressure that like, I have to be successful. I need, I need to be a director. I got to work at these prestigious institutions. I got to make six figures. Like I have to, I have to do these things. And I measured myself by those achievements. But what happens if you lose all of that? right? We're in a pandemic right now. Folks are losing jobs through no fault of their own, right? And I think it can be really difficult and you can internalize that. But you are a person, you have value regardless of what your job is, or if you don't have one, and that this is just a a small component of who you are and the impact you make in this world. All right, Tom, let's hear it. But I don't know, there's like a million things. See, this is the one question I wish I heard in advance because there's so many different things (laughs) I'm thinking of. Um, uh, One thing that's coming to mind is if if you are able to, if you're privileged enough to be able to, it's okay to shift gears to try things out. And if it's not working, go in a different direction. Um, I guess that in some ways goes along the lines with like, what do I want to do when I grow up? You know, we're still asking ourselves this (laughs) sometimes many years, many decades into our career. Um, and also the other thing that has just become really abundantly clear to me throughout my career is I will absolutely do my best when I'm in an environment and working with a team um, that, that is a caring team that really cares about who I am as a person, not just as a worker bee. Um, and again, not everyone is lucky enough to have that environment, but I've personally found that when I do have that, I'm able to do my best. For me, you all, I think you do a lot of work going throughout the collegiate experience to attempt to secure a role at a company. A lot of it is taking on these various extracurricular activities to show just how well-rounded and engaged you are. Don't lose that when you get in the workplace. Where your passions and purpose reside, don't give those up. And I'm telling you this from personal experience where for the last decade plus, I feel all the amazing things that I was passionate about, public speaking, speech and debate, dance, volleyball, tennis, I let go. For a decade because I consumed myself so much with work. And it wasn't until the COVID-19 pandemic over the last three months that I have sought that level of reflection and re-engagement and understood part of what made me stand out at Google, at Snapchat, at Nike was this well-rounded experience of what I have done. And so it is critical that I find that. And that is the inherent balance when we talk about work-life balance. It's not just spending time solo or time with your family or time with your friends. It is getting to those passions and purposes that help you feel like a truly fulfilled person. Don't lose that. It's what got you to that point. It's what will help you excel further. Great advice. Thanks so much, everyone. I really, really appreciate it. Um, Our team at Monster really appreciates it. This is just an incredible conversation. And so thank you all. Um, I put my email in the chat, stacy.furtado at monster.com. Please follow up with me with any questions. All you great social media minds come my way. Um, And everyone, we can't wait for you to get into the workforce and we hope to be your colleagues one day. So thank you guys. And um, we will talk to you soon.